All right, while we are between our two main series for this year, okay, this year we're going through 1 Timothy, that was the first part of the year, and then 2 Timothy will kick off in August. So in between 1 and 2 Timothy, we thought it would be a good opportunity for us to take a little bit of a breather, a little bit of a break, uh, allow you guys to explore other, you know, to flip to other portions of Scripture. And so far we've heard from Psalm 37, we've heard from the Gospel of Luke, um, We've heard from, uh, or we're going to hear from Gospel of Luke, 1 Peter as well. And during this COVID-19 season, I think, I think the word that we always hear, the words, we hear fluid, and we hear unprecedented, uh, so much so that it's starting to get old as far as vocabulary words. But we've all learned how to navigate life in a different way. We've learned how to do things remotely, and at the advice of the scientific community and public health officials, we pivoted from life in person to life online, to life face-to-face, -to, -face, to life screen-to-screen. -screen. Many of us may have doubled down on food delivery services like your Grubhub or your DoorDash. We've no doubt increased our Amazon.com traffic and our purchases, which just is so easy at the click of a button. Our children have learned how to use Zoom, uh, complete with texting privately in chat, and I guess, uh, you know, putting all of these funny smiley faces everywhere. For the most part, people have adapted to the challenges of online education. But the move to online interaction is not just throughout our country, it was also here at our church. We held fellowship groups, small groups, Sunday school meetings through Zoom. We had church members meeting on Zoom, which, by the way, resulted in one of the most highest attended members meetings. We learned how to find our church YouTube channel, even though many of us didn't know we had a YouTube channel to begin with. Interestingly, I think we had several. <laughs> one of them was like just to test things out. We learned how to produce a live stream back there. If you notice in the back there, not only there's the video, is there a video camera, there's a whole nother desk back there. And actually we had to buy, get this, we had to buy a gaming laptop for our church. And lest you gamers out there think that it's for games, it's actually for live stream because we needed a discrete graphics card in order to uh, do all of this. We learned how to watch church service instead of coming to church service. And some of us got really comfortable sitting on the couch at home, nice cup of coffee in hand, in our pajamas. And somehow during this process of pivoting from seeing each other face to face to seeing each other screen to screen, I think there was a question that is lurking underneath it that maybe you're thinking about even now as I'm speaking up here. Is this the future of church? Is online the way to go? Higher education has been talking about this for a long time. Many colleges, universities, and those kinds of institutions have been looking into this whole online education component, equipping their classrooms with high quality video cameras that you know, can be moved remotely, figuring out how to do that live stream, how to record it, and then how to present it to people so that they can take online classes. Is this, is this the new normal? Is this what, should we, what we should expect in the future? Is online church here forever? And perhaps the deeper question is, should it be? This morning, I want to bring us back to some elementary principles for living together as a church family. And I want us to think about corporate worship. What is it that we do when we come here? How does a church gather for worship? And why does a church gather for worship? So if you want a title for the message this morning, it would be A Theology of Corporate Worship. By the way, I want to just say it up front that I, 
I found the, these three books really, really helpful uh, in preparation for this message. In fact, I, I probably read these and then a few others just for this message alone because there's so much to kind of pick up. There's so much to learn. So much of the content for this sermon comes from these three resources. And so here's where we're going this morning. Number one, we're asking how we gather for worship. Number two, we're asking why we gather for worship. And number three, we will address common misconceptions about worship. So I know that typically I come up here and I'm like, turn your Bibles to this one passage and you know you can get there and you can just lay it out there because you're going to be here for a while. But today we're going to go all over the place. It will be similar to a sword drill so you can see how fast your fingers can get you to the various passages. Or if you would like to sit down and relax, most of them are going to be up on the screen. So let's talk about the first point, how we gather for worship. First of all, we gather by God's grace. Ephesians 1, 3 to 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Now that, that sentence goes on because it's a really long run-on sentence. Okay, um, but I think this is a reminder to all of us that how we gather, we gather by God's grace. What we get to do, this is God's grace towards us. This is a privilege and a blessing. It's not a right. It is not something that we are entitled to. In fact, every month I get, I, I get a, our church has a subscription to Voice of the Martyrs. And so every month, I'm, I'm reminded, at least on a monthly basis, of people across the world who are persecuted for their faith, who cannot just gather normally. They've got to gather almost in a clandestine meeting of sorts, from place to place, from people's homes to people's homes. Don't leave your shoes outside the door that everybody's going to know we're having a large gathering. Just come in and put your, short, put your shoes inside. They need to move from place to place so that they don't get caught. Now, since God, now on, on a bigger picture though, since God is the one who chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that means that we are members of his body because of his grace. Because of his grace. It wasn't that we showed up when we said, God, I'm good enough. You got to let me in. Let me try out for you and I'll prove to you that I can make it on your team. I, be, I deserve to be on team Jesus because I'm so great. None of us can claim that. All of us understand that the cross was necessary, not just for that person down the street or that other person, but necessary for us because we are not good enough. There, was never, there is never a moment when we do not need the grace of God. God hears our prayers because he is gracious. God gathers us to himself because he is gracious. God allows us to gather with brothers and sisters like here because he is gracious. And so let me put it this way. We swim in an ocean of grace. We swim in an ocean of grace. So how do we gather? We gather by God's grace. How else do we gather? We gather around God's word. We gather around God's word. Colossians 3, 16 to 17 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, how do we gather around God's word? Colossians tells us that our lives ought to be saturated by God's word. It ought to be saturated by God's word. And that comes out. It comes out when we gather to worship. Because what is it that we do when we gather? When we gather as God's people here in a church service, what do we do? We sing God's word. We hear from God's word. We pray in accordance with God's word, and we respond to God's word. Everything is based around God and his word. We sing God's word. 
when we select music for worship. It isn't just, let's just figure out what shows up on Pandora. Or, I don't know, why don't we just ask a random praise song, you know, I'll, I'll flip on my radio at 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 6 o'clock, and, the, and whatever, I, the first song I hear, that's the song that we're, that we're playing. We actually think about the music set that we put together. And for those of us who are involved or have been involved in the planning of the service, you know that typically on a Tuesday, if, if, if I'm on top of things, on Tuesday, I will send out an outline of the sermon for that Sunday. And the point of that is so that the music leader can be on the same, hopefully the same wavelength as the sermon, so that the going forth of God's word comes through the sermon and through the music. Songs do more than just fill us with emotion. Songs do more than just lift our hearts to the Lord. Songs teach us things, right? Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? For the Bible tells me so. Even just in that short phrase, we understand that the root of truth, the source of truth, comes from God's word. How do we know that there is salvation through Jesus Christ? God's word. How do we know that Jesus loves us? God's word. So first, we sing God's word. Second, we hear from God's word, right? Our singing should be consistent with God's word. And when we gather as a church, we gather to hear from God's word, which has been preserved for us. We look at what it says, and we consider how it can be applied in our lives. And when Jesus prayed on behalf of the disciples, not only the disciples with him who were, uh, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, a stone's throw away, he also prayed for disciples of all time, which would extend to us. What did Jesus say in John 17, 17? He said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Psalm 119, verse 9 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. So the word of God, the Bible, scripture, is a guard and a guide. It guards us from sin and temptation, and it guides us to following the Lord. Third, we pray in accordance with God's word. God answers prayer in accordance with his will. And though we may not know God's will in every situation, we know that God is working all things for his good purposes. 1 John 5, 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And fourth and finally, we respond to God's word, right? Because it is not just enough to just listen and gather information as if somehow we were preparing for a lifelong Bible Jeopardy game. James 1, says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It is important that we are students of God's word, but we learn and we know God's word in order to live in God's way. This is not learning the Bible just so you, just so you know a lot of Bible facts. This is learning for living, which I, I believe is the motto behind uh, Truth For Life, Alistair Begg's radio ministry, where the learning is for living. Back in 2012, um, I picked up a book that was written to help pastors maintain their own spiritual health. It was written by Paul David Tripp, and it was tremendously helpful for my personal walk. It was called Dangerous Calling. It was an orange book, and it had like this hazard sign, and it says Dangerous Calling, confronting the new, I think it's, I think the subtitle is Confronting the Unique Challenges of Pastoral Ministry. On the back cover of that book, there are endorsements. And again, if you want to promote a book, you, you, you find the, the biggest name you can and put their name to associate with your name so that somehow by association, people will think about reading your book. There were five endorsements from well-known pastors in the United States of America. And as of today, two of them had to step down from ministry due to moral failure. And one of them says that he no longer believes in Jesus anymore. Just because you know God's word doesn't mean that you necessarily respond to it. 
right? Knowing God's word without responding deludes us into thinking that we are holy just by virtue of knowledge. But we are holy not because we know holy things, but because we know it and we live according to it. So how do we gather? How do we gather? Church, we gather by God's grace. We gather around God's word. And thirdly, we gather for God's glory. Colossians 3.16, which I read a little bit before, it says that God's word ought to permeate our lives and our worship. Okay, and verse 17 says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In other words, we are to do everything for the glory and honor of God. So instead of a WWJD bracelet, it would say WWGG, what would glorify God? That, that's how we ought to think about it. In deciding what we do on a day-to-day throughout your Monday to Friday, what would glorify God? Okay. And fourth, we gather, how do we gather? We gather with appropriate attitudes, with appropriate attitudes. God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, into the world to save us from the penalty of sin and to deliver us into his kingdom. And because of our adoption into God's family, we can call God our heavenly father. And God beckons us to himself to commune with him in prayer and to pour out our hearts to him. God invites us to cast all our anxieties upon him because he cares for us. So God is our heavenly father, but we must remember that God is still God. He is the creator and we are his creation, right? We want to remember there is a distinction between God, our creator, and us, his creation. And so when we gather for corporate worship, when we gather for corporate worship, we should come with appropriate attitudes. Here are three, all starting with the letter G, thanks to, thanks to the writer Matt Merker. Gravity, gladness, and gratitude. See, I'm not the only one who likes to alliterate things. So gravity, gladness, and gratitude. Hebrews 12, verses 28 to 29 says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Here at Laguna, we gather once a month for Lord's Supper. That was the table out in front of the door. Um, We gather once a month for Lord's Supper because we want to meditate on the person and work of Jesus Christ. We don't want Jesus' sacrifice on the cross to be so far from our minds. And we need to remember it. I remember when I first got married, I remember how how this ring would always be a reminder. You know, as you just move and you, oh, what's that? Oh, oh, there's something on my finger, right? You're you're washing dishes and it's easy to slip off because of the soap. And it's, it's this reminder that I am married and that God is gracious to a sinner like me. And in the same way, Lord's Supper is a reminder that God is gracious to sinners such as us, such as And what does that mean? That means that our corporate worship should not be characterized by an endless list of jokes, just idle chatter or trivial banter. We did not come to hear a comedy hour. And if you did, you need a refund. But look, that we, we come with a degree of, 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 of gravity, of sobriety. Right? We come because we understand that we are coming to worship God who loved us so much that he sent and sacrificed his one and only son. That we enjoy grace because of someone's sacrifice. That the only contribution to our salvation was the sin that made it necessary. Now, does that mean we should never smile when we're at church? Does that mean we need to walk in with our eyes perpetually looking at the floor and just kind of go, oh, hi, how are are you doing? Oh, you have a good week? Oh, good, I'm glad. You know, it's not like we're, this is not, uh, this is not that kind of gathering. But we don't come with this sort of flippant attitude.
Sometimes people think that worshiping the Lord with gravity means putting on this sad face all the time. But remember that the opposite of gravity would be levity. Okay? Which means that we would take Christ's death for granted. And may it never be said that those who are in Christ take the death of Christ for granted. That is why when we gather for the Lord's Supper, we eschew, we we put away the sins. Because may it never be that we continue to hold on to the sin that put Jesus on the cross. Because that would not be approaching the Lord's table with the appropriate attitude of gravity. Furthermore, we are reminded in Scripture that we are to gather with the appropriate attitude of gladness. We should not wallow in the doldrums of despair. Rather, it means that we rejoice and be glad and give thanks for what was done on the cross, recognizing the costliness of it, right? We have reasons to rejoice and be glad. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Rejoice always. Psalm 51, or 95, verse 1 says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Notice the joy and the rejoicing is connected with salvation, right? Third is we have an attitude of gratitude, of gratefulness, of thanksgiving. Ephesians 5.20 says, Give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think for a moment, what happens when you receive gifts in your life? When someone gives you a gift, say it's your your birthday or an anniversary or something like that, how do you respond? Well, your parents told you, right? What do you say? What do you say? Thank you. No, no, say it louder. Excuse me. You got to say it to the person. Person just gave you a gift. You know, you don't need any more Pokemon cards, but somehow you have more. Just say thank you. Say thank you. Say aloud so they can hear you. We say thank you. We express our appreciation with gladness and gratitude. And so if we were to put all of this together into a sentence about how we gather for worship, it is this. We gather to worship by God's grace, around God's word, for God's glory, and with appropriate attitudes. There it is in a sentence. Now, second, the second part of our sermon or our sermonar today, I guess, would be why we gather for worship. Why do we gather for worship? But first, when we talk about gathering for worship, we need to talk about church. What is the meaning of church, okay? And when you think of the word church, you will normally think of two different definitions. There is the universal church, broad, general, large, and the local church, smaller, uh, usually in a geographical area, okay? The universal church is the community of all true believers for all time. That means you are part of the universal church with someone living, living in Lebanon. Though you don't know who that person is. You may not know what that person looks like, how tall the person is, how much the person weighs. Whether even if the person is male or female, you have no idea. But you are part of the universal church with that person who is a genuine believer in Lebanon. Now, in contrast to the universal church, there is the local church, which you can define as a group of Christians who regularly gather in Christ's name to officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Jesus Christ and his kingdom through gospel preaching and gospel ordinances. And that comes courtesy of uh, Jonathan Lehman's book, Church Membership, which I would highly encourage as as an excellent read. Okay, but it is a group of Christians who regularly gather. Okay, there's a regularly gathering But it's not just a gathering just as a social club. It's gathering in Christ's name, okay? And to officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Jesus Christ and his kingdom through gospel preaching, what's happening now, and gospel ordinances like Lord's Supper and baptism, So why do we gather for worship, okay? And I'm talking about a local church here, okay? Why? Because the universal church does not gather right? We understand the universal church cannot gather, but there will be a great gathering at the throne room in heaven. But until that happens, we we can't gather in one single place, okay? We, why? Why do we gather for worship? Because we are a local church. 
because we are a local church. And the local church is what? It's a group of believers, right? So this is a, a group of people, right? Acts 18, 22, when he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church. Okay, this is Paul. He did not walk up to the building and shake hands with the building. He greeted the church, the people who are known as the church, right? Romans 16, verse 5a, greet also the church in, the church in their house, right? It's, it's not about a building. It's not about a structure. It's about a people. Why else? The local church is described in Scripture as a group of believers. It is also described in Scripture as a group of believers who gather regularly. They gather together regularly. Addressing division in the, in the early church of Corinth, Paul writes this, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. So even from its infancy, even from its beginning, the New Testament church gathered regularly together, right? And Acts 5.12 says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico, known as Solomon's porch also. Okay? So they gathered in a particular place. It was a group of believers who gathered together regularly, but they also acted together. They acted together. In Acts 15, it says, Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. So this is the whole church gathering and making a decision together. Does that kind of sound like a members meeting? We need to fix the roof. And so at Laguna, the church gathered together in order to make a decision to fix the roof, lest it cause additional harm. Right? 1 Corinthians 5.13, purge the evil person from among you. And this was, this was a man who had been having relations with his stepmother, and the church wanted to brag to, to the world and said, look, we're so accepting. We, we, we even love this person. But the person who was engaged in this immorality was not wanting to repent. And so Paul said, that's not, that's not right. That is a gross perversion this man should not be sleeping with his stepmother. You need to confront that and address that because apparently this guy does not want to turn away from doing what is sinful. You need to expel or purge the evil person from among you. Now, what else? How, how else uh, do we understand the local church? The local church is an assembly. It is an assembly. And this is something that you probably haven't heard before. Um, this requires a refined understanding of the word church as it is used in scripture, okay? Now, we may think of different things when we hear the word church. Some people think of church as the building or the structure, right? Other people think of church in terms of social ramifications as if it's like a social club. I'm part of that country club. Oh, okay, I'm part of the church, okay? But it would be wise for us to return to the original Greek term behind the word church, what is the Greek term that gets translated as church? In the New Testament, the English word church is a translation of the Greek word ekklesia. Ekklesia. Okay. And this term, ekklesia, refers to an assembly of people. An assembly of people. When the Jewish people translated their Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek, they use this term assembly as a translation of the Hebrew term assembly or congregation. Now, how does this idea help us understand the importance of gathering as a church? The idea of church flows naturally out of the meaning of the word ekklesia. The Greek word ekklesia means an assembly, a gathering, a congregation, a community. Ecclesia is distinct from another group, from another Greek word called demos, okay, which means people. So assembly is a group of people gathered, but demos is just people. Our, word, our English words democracy and demography have that Greek word demos, 
Okay? Now, when people gather for an express purpose, they become an ecclesia. So a demos uh, is, this, is a bunch of the dots. But when they gather for an express intended purpose, when they assemble for a purpose, they become an assembly, they become an ecclesia. So in other words, when we gather as God's people, we become a visible representation of God's kingdom on earth. There is something genuinely special that takes place when we gather for worship because it is a preview and a foretaste of heaven. When we gather we take on a unique identity. Now, let me expound upon this nuance with an illustration from Merker's book, Corporate Worship. It's that small little light blue, sky blue book that I showed you earlier, okay? This, 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 uh, this idea, this concept seems a little abstract, so let me, let me try and make it a little bit more concrete. In our country... We've got uh, the Supreme Court of the United States. And there are nine Supreme Court justices. And as individuals, each justice is a judge in his or her own right. When they are studying in their office with that staff doing uh, legal research, they are still judges. When they're out shopping for groceries, they are still judges. When they walk down the halls, uh, when they walk down the halls, they are still judges. But when these nine Supreme Court justices sit together, when they come together and they summon the court, and the court is in session, these nine individual justices become the Supreme Court of the United States though they are clearly judges by themselves, when they come together, they become the Supreme Court of the United States. They take on a special, unique corporate identity. In the same way, every person who believes in Jesus as Lord and Savior is a Christian. In the home and outside the home, that person is a Christian. But when Christians gather together in a local assembly, they take on a new, unique corporate identity known as the church. When we take communion together, which we will do after this message, we are proclaiming Jesus Christ as Savior. And we are doing it as a church. When we sing praises, we are proclaiming God's greatness, great are you, Lord, as a church. When we listen to the word of God together, we are all submitting to God's word as a church. So why do we gather? Because this is what it means to be a local church. Now, you may have been feeling this in our hiatus, during our hiatus, during our break from meeting in person, face to face. You may have felt like, oh, I feel like a, a severed hand away from the body. I don't feel, I feel like something's off. And that's right. Because this is what it means to be a local church, to be an ecclesia. We are more than just a, a, a random assortment of people. We are a people gathered for a specific purpose. We are gathered by Christ for God's glory. And we are known as the local church. So why else do we gather? We gather because we are a local church, and that's part of the definition. But we also gather because we are a family. Right? In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Yes, personal salvation is always important. There's not a group, group salvation plan, okay? There's an, it, it must be individual. But once that individual has become a Christian, that individual is grafted in, is adopted into a new family. 
So we are family. At the moment of salvation, God adopts you into his family. And yes, it's the universal church family, but y'all don't know people in Lebanon. You know people here in a local church setting. We'll meet them later. We'll meet those people who are living across the world, across the ocean, and who lived at different, different times. We will meet them in heaven. But for now, we know each other here. So why do we gather? Because we are a local church, because we are a family, because we love and care for each other. And this is the one that gets trotted out all the time, right? Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12 also adds, so with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Why do we gather for worship? Because we love and care for each other. How do you love and care for people you don't know because you haven't met them yet here? How do you love and care for people that you don't ever see or you don't ever talk to? We don't have everyone's cell phone numbers. We don't have everyone's contact information. And sometimes the way that we begin that is by seeing each other at church and asking, hey, would you like to get together for coffee? How are you doing? Would your family like to come over? That's, that's like natural and normal. And that's the way that we would get to the point where we would encourage one another. Why else do we gather as a church? Fourth, because we are a witness to the world. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, don't get me wrong. Is it convenient to come to church? No. <laughs> no. It's much more convenient to, you know, just like, sit down on the couch and like flip on the TV because, well, that's how we unwind, right? That's how we relax. What requires the least amount of work to do on a Sunday morning? I'd say sleeping. When you wake up in the morning and you go through your morning routine, it's tempting to look longingly back at your bed, the source of warmth and comfort. And to look back at it and just kind of go, wow, it's like it's calling me. It would be easier not to come to church, right? And now that you can watch online, it's tempting to just go back to bed. And say, I'll watch it on the recording. It'll save me, well, a bunch of time. I can eat, I can eat breakfast while I'm watching. I eat breakfast and a cup of coffee while I'm, while I'm watching church. But let me ask you, now that we have been given kind of clearance to go out into society, to go into stores, to resume kind of more of a closer to normal life, depending on your vaccination status, I mean, what kind of testimony does that leave for our neighbors? What does that communicate to other people about our priorities? And what are we teaching the next generation about the importance of church? It is easier, so much easier to just stay home and watch online. But it's off. So how do we gather for worship? Why do we gather for worship? Let me address some common misconceptions about worship. Some things that I've heard people say. First, I really enjoyed the worship arrangement today. I really enjoyed the worship arrangement today. Worship is more than just music. And oftentimes we, we, we unconsciously 
exchange, we, we, we use worship and music as a synonym, right? I enjoyed that worship set. So as soon as the music's over, you stop worshiping? Is that, is that how it goes? It's on, it's off, it's on, it's off. Is it as soon as like the last chord fades? Or is it after the closing prayer that, that the worship stops? No, the whole thing is worship. The whole service is worship. It is corporate worship. And then after you leave these doors, you are going on to worship God through your daily lives. It is a life of worship. But this is a pointed time for corporate worship. Worship is more than just music. We worship through singing praises to the Lord. We worship through giving sacrificially to the church and to other people who are in need. We worship through encouraging one another in the Lord. We worship through praying for each other. We worship through loving each other as Christ loved us. We worship through hearing and responding to God's word. We don't just worship through music. The music stops, but the worship doesn't. The worship continues on. Yes, we worship through music, but music is not the only way we worship. Another common misconception I hear is, ah, it's okay. I know, it's a little bit late. The, the bed beckoned me. The words were, it's, it was so winsome this morning, and I just didn't, couldn't make it out. I can still watch the sermon later if I miss the service. And yes, you can still watch the sermon later for now. But coming to corporate worship is more than just the sermon. I think when people come in and like, oh, good, I didn't miss the sermon. I didn't miss the sermon. I'm like, wait a second, you missed the rest of the service. Sometimes the most uplifting thing in the worship service is the music set. And that's okay. That's totally fine because God speaks to us and ministers to us through different ways in different media. Coming to corporate worship is more than just listening to a sermon. That would be equivalent to saying, I listen to lectures online, therefore I'm a student in the class. It's not true. That's why we sing God's word, we pray God's word, we read God's word, we learn from God's word, we respond to God's word. The entire service is focused on honoring God. The joy of singing and praying together is a foretaste of heaven. It's not just about, oh, I didn't miss the sermon. Third, you do not need to go to church to be the church. You heard this? You don't have to go to church to be the church. That is an unfortunate conflation or confusing of universal church and local church. Yes, once you're a Christian, you're part of the local church. Done deal. You can't undo that, really. But being part of the local church actually means a geographical, it's tied to something geographically. Hopefully from this message, you've seen what it, you've, you've learned a little bit more about what it means to be a church. And you've seen that being the church means more than just making a profession of faith. God adopts us into his family and places us into a local community known as the local church. We care for each other. We pray for each other. We love each other. We serve each other. Remember, the church, the local church, is a gathering. It's a gathering. And, and when, we, when we care for each other, when we serve each other, when we greet one another, that all happens when we interact. There is a difference between seeing each other and viewing something online. During this pandemic, I meet with other pastors, and especially when we are all kind of doing the live stream thing, we are all asking each other, so how's, how's your church? How are they doing? How's attendance? And all of us just said, we got no idea. Why? Because we're putting it on YouTube. We don't know how many people are watching. Click, view, click, view. If I wanted to create a computer program, I could just have it click over and over again and increase the views. 
I just don't know who's coming. I don't know who's watching. I don't know who's participating. Unless you signed in, which none of you did. But I can't, I can't, we will not know. So we don't know if pe- where people are. And it's awfully hard to care for people when you never see them or talk to them or interact with them. Church is a participation thing. It's not a spectator sport. C.H. Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers uh, of all time, he was always full of these pithy and memorable illustrations. And, and he said once, he said, he said, a lot of Christians out there, they're content with being bricks. Bricks. Like, you know, the red brick, bricks. I said, and I see Christians out there and they're just bricks. Scattered on the street. But it doesn't, it's inconsistent with the purpose. Because what's the purpose of a brick? What's the purpose of a brick? The brick is meant to build things. It's meant to be used to build up some sort of building or build up a structure or to build a brick pathway. It's meant to be put together like Lego pieces to make something. It's not just meant to be a random brick just strewn about, just sitting in the middle of the road. The brick is meant for a bigger purpose. It's meant to integrate and interface with other bricks in order to form something. And this is the idea of the local church and the body of Christ. And I know that during this pandemic, we've been separated. We've been bricks kind of thrown asunder, thrown out there. But we were never meant to just be individual bricks. There's no such thing as God making too many bricks. Every brick has a purpose and fits into a bigger picture. And that's the church. I've heard uh, some people, I'm talking to you on the live stream, I've heard some, from some people who are, are saying, you know, pastor, we'd like to come back, but it's so hard with the kids. I get it. I live it. Okay? And my wife's a saint. So, are, so is anyone who's in Christ, but... but <laughs> I especially thank God for her, right? Okay? And some people have said, well, we used to have children's ministry during first hour. We used to have a children's worship service. They'd, they'd be here for a little bit, and then they'd be dismissed after the worship through music, right? And then, you know, we'd also have nursery and also have these other things, and and, and people have asked, hey, so pastor, you know, they've asked leaders, so, so when's the church bringing it back? And I would love just to respond to that now and saying, when's the church going to do it? Do you think we outsource this to India? We are the church. So the question is, when can we bring this back? Because the answer is not because we don't want to. The answer is not because, well, we just figure... Parents need to be sanctified a little bit more. Let's let them watch their kids. Oh, we just want them to be more grateful for the children's workers. So let's let them sweat it out a little bit longer. No, the reason is because we don't have enough people to help right now. So instead of asking, when is the church going to bring that back? How about we have people sign up and help? And just say, we want to have these things back. Let's volunteer. Let's help bring it together. So here's my plea to you. This is what we do as a church. We gather to worship corporately. We gather as a family. We gather as God's people. So come back come back. 
Come back not just because we want to care for you. Come back because God calls you to care for us. We don't come to church just to get something. We come to be the church, and we come to give to one another. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and that it speaks to us from larger passages, but also from a bunch of different passages as we piece it together to understand what you call the church to be. And so gathering together is part of being the church. Lord, we pray that you would encourage those who are still watching from home that they would take the steps to come back so that we can be the church together, so that they can encourage others and so that they can be encouraged by us. We pray in all these things for your grace and your mercy that you would convict us so that we might come back once again as your people to sing your praises together in one place. And in your son's name we pray. Amen.